there's a feeling that the union gives you that security, that individuality, that freedom. If you help the guy at the bottom of the social ladder, you bring everything up with you. And that's what we're all about. We work the docks and warehouses. We handle the tugs and barges and the tour boats. We are fish processors, cotton compress workers, and heavy equipment operators. We work in hospitals, hotels, mines, and refineries. We are the ILWU. We live in Canada and Hawaii and all along the Pacific coast. Although we work in many occupations and we come from different cultures, we have much in common. We are members of a democratic union where an injury to any one of us is an injury to all. We are a family and share a common history. One of the things that the bosses have been very successful at is separating workers and people from their past. When you have no appreciation of who you are and what your struggles were, you have no understanding of your real accomplishments. We've inherited a union born of militancy and personal sacrifice, with a profound commitment to the welfare of workers everywhere. Today, as the ILWU faces new challenges, our strength comes from our solidarity and knowing who we are and where we've been. There are some felt needs of all working people that if you do not fight for, you will certainly lose, regardless of the fact that we can talk about, well, the world has changed so much, why in the world should we worry about what happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when 28,000 workers went out on strike, or when two longshoremen were killed on the streets of San Francisco? It is so important for young people to recognize what happened in the past and how it affects them now. In our grandparents' time, workers had no protection. They labored long hours for meager wages. When they grew old, they had little to show for all their years of work. They earned no pension and had no health care. Often, they worked until the day they died. Workers should know this. They should know how men died on the job. They should know that men were retired on the job by simply moving them up into another position and they died with their boots on without even the benefit of a headstone because they were too poor to buy it. If they couldn't get away from the waterfront, they just worked until uh, they died because uh, their lifespan wasn't that big in those days. Men begged for work in shape-ups, hungry and desperate they'd buy a day's work with bribes and kickbacks to the bosses. Well, they would get the guys on the job and, and uh, work them as long as 36 hours straight. Uh, if they got hurt on the job, that's just too bad. You know, that's, that's, they just get somebody else to do, the, to do the work. Injuries were commonplace. Bosses demanded speed and cared little for safety. For the crippled worker, there was no welfare, no workman's compensation. 
He often was dependent on the charity of others. In 1929, Americans fell upon hard times in the Great Depression. There were no jobs. Misery was nothing new to longshoremen, but the struggle to survive grew more desperate. Without jobs, people became hungry. In these worst of times, men gathered on the waterfront. Along the piers and in the bread lines, a word echoed among the hungry men. The word was union. Workers appealed to the International Longshoremen's Association on the East Coast. In 1933, they were granted a Pacific Coast Charter for a coastwide union. Now, for the first time, when the workers met with the employers, they would be heard. Nothing ever comes to the working man or woman on a silver platter, free, gratis. It has every crumb, everything we get has to be fought for. Longshoremen demanded a union-controlled hiring hall to ensure equal access to jobs. They called for the end of the shape-up. For their work, they demanded a decent wage and working conditions. When the employers refused to negotiate, longshoremen in a united front struck the entire Pacific coast. Seamen joined the strike, and all shipping came to a virtual standstill. City police departments from Seattle to San Pedro, urged on by shipping companies, reacted swiftly. In 1934 on the waterfront in Portland, um, the National Guard was called out and they put machine gun nests on top of the terminals. And they had strike committees and uh, going down on the piers and uh, putting up the picket lines and, and keeping the membership informed of what was happening. It wasn't a lot different in Portland than in San Francisco. Uh, we didn't get people killed, but we got people bullied, and we got people pushed around, and we got people hurt. It's my understanding that the first two longshoremen killed were killed in the port of San Pedro. Uh, I remember my dad coming home. Uh, I was a young kid then. I must, must have been only about five with his head busted open, and, uh, and he was unconscious, and he was being carried by uh, three, three, I guess, of his friends or longshoremen. And uh, I can remember, still, still visualize them carrying them up the steps. Ship owners began hiring strike breakers. On the streets, the longshoremen stood their ground. Armed only by their convictions, they confronted the police. Never again would they beg and bribe a boss for a day's work. On July 5th, Police opened fire on the workers of San Francisco. When the shooting was over, two workers lay dead. Both had been shot in the back. In the years to come, the lives of working people would greatly improve. But these men would never see that day, nor would they know their dying would be remembered for generations. The killing stunned working people everywhere. Thousands left their jobs to watch the longshoremen bury their dead in a solemn parade up Market Street. These men were killed for their right to organize. They stood before loaded guns, demanding a union and a living wage for their labor and respect for their work. You think about the people that died in 1934. They didn't die for nothing. 
They gave their life so we could have a better life. We're still trying to carry on what they stood for. We're still trying to carry on what they fought and died for. Workers were killed from San Pedro to Seattle. Following the killings in San Francisco, the National Guard moved in, armed for battle. Organized labor responded by calling for a general strike. Rarely in American history have workers banded together in such outrage. For the people of San Francisco, there would be no business as usual. Three days the city lay silent. Commerce had stopped. But never again will we see the day when men would be chosen for a job standing in the middle of the street, called in like you would some dog. Longshoremen had won the first coastwide contract in history. They won their hiring hall and a six hour day. They now had a strong and determined leader. Out of the turmoil rose a lanky ex sailor named Harry Bridges. Having worked as a longshoreman for 12 years, Bridges relentlessly fought for conditions. The strike itself brought on new type of leadership guys like Harry Bridges, who remained one of the poorest paid labor leaders for, for a union in the country. I don't think the man owned two suits of clothes. That's the type of guy he was, you know. The struggles of 1934 marked the character of this union. Controlled by the rank and file, each member would vote by secret ballot on contracts and policy and officers. And above all, every member would be ensured fair and equal access to work. Everybody was more or less on the same footing in terms of being able to get a fairly decent living and they wouldn't be feasting on one side and famine on the other side. But that's what the hiring hall does, that it, it makes us all equal. During the 1934 strike, the local in San Francisco opened its membership to African Americans for the first time. In the past, employers had pitted worker against worker, using race to divide men. The best instrument that the employer has is to turn one against another based on race. It's so easy to go into the hole of the ship, in the front hold, in the front number one hatch, where there were black people working and tell them those fellas are number five hatch. They're all white and they're working, doing twice as good as you are. It's very easy to do that. But when you put them all together, it says, look, we're in this together. It's out there, let's go get it together. Soon after the big strike, warehousemen joined with the longshoremen. Three years later, the union took a new name. It was now the ILWU, the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union. The union's attention now turned to organizing. The ILWU opened its doors to men and women in other occupations. Warehousemen began to reach out to workers away from the waterfront. In an organizing drive known as the March Inland, warehousemen brought thousands of new workers into the union. Without the union, without a collective bargaining agreement, the boss can do anything that he wants to me, and I have absolutely no control over that part which defines me as a human being, which is a worker. The warehouseman's division was growing rapidly. The waterfront appeared secure. But among the victories on the West Coast, there were also bitter disappointments. In the Battle of Ballantine Pier, Canadian longshoremen were gassed, beaten, and clubbed by police as they marched against the hiring of non-union workers. For the next 10 years, permanent strike breakers would keep the port of Vancouver open. Oh, 
In Hilo, Hawaii, police armed with rifles and bayonets attacked peaceful pickets supporting a strike. The Hilo massacre angered working people throughout Hawaii and the West Coast. Many of the Hawaiians worked on ships. Some of them were in the various ports that were engaged in the general strike, so that when they returned to Hawaii and we all tried to organize the longshoremen, they at least had that part of history. They knew what a general strike meant in terms of workers getting together and taking control over their lives. A seaman had come to Hawaii a few years before. Aware that workers in Hawaii had struggled for years to improve conditions, Jack Hall talked to the longshoremen about joining the ILWU. When Jack Hall came to the islands and talked about organizing one big industrial union, regardless of ethnicity and culture, Everybody said, this is the way in which we can really go and be successful as a union. Hawaii's longshoremen applied for a charter from the ILWU. Soon, they sent organizers into the sugar and pineapple plantations. The union welcomed all workers, regardless of their race or national origin. When we go out and organize other workers, we can ensure that the ILWU is strong. We are no stronger than that unemployed worker out there. We are no stronger than the other workers who don't have the benefits that we have. That's what unions are about, not only to improve your own lot, but in, to improve the lot of workers in general. Organizing stopped in its tracks when bombs fell on Pearl Harbor. Hawaii came under martial law as America entered World War II. Dock workers were now essential to the war effort. During the war, the government rounded up Japanese Americans. Some were members of the ILWU. Pulled from their homes and livelihood, they were forced into internment camps. During this time, few people spoke up in their behalf. Lou Goldblatt, the secretary treasurer of the ILWU, was one who did. Lou Goldblatt and his declaration before a congressional committee was absolutely the flagship of everything that the ILWU did, which indicated that it was serious about uniting all people and ending discrimination because of the color of one's skin. As the country moved from war to peace, the union's energy focused on organizing workers. In these years, the ILWU experienced one of the most successful organizing drives in labor history, bringing thousands of new members into the union. Plantation workers joined the union. Through vigorous organizing and political activism, Hawaii grew to be the largest section in the ILWU. In British Columbia, longshoremen voted unanimously to affiliate with the ILWU. In 1959, the union became an independent, autonomous area and expanded into other industries, evolving into a progressive political force in Canada. As the ILWU grew strong on the West Coast, it attracted powerful enemies. Company owners and politicians vied to weaken the union by disabling its strong leadership. Government agents conspired to destroy Harry Bridges by accusing him of being a member of the Communist Party.
After 20 years of harassment and four court trials, the government's case collapsed and Bridges was acquitted of all charges. Because of communism being the big number one uh, enemy, uh, if they paint you with a communist brush, you know, you would be less acceptable as a union. Many of us don't know communism from rheumatism. We're interested in unionism and the rights of all of us to be employed and will not be herded and divided by name calling. While Harry Bridges fought in the courts, Congress passed new anti-labor laws. Unions were now hit by a political backlash. The business people and the employers in particular were the ones that uh, wanted to give the union a bad name because it was such a powerful force in terms of uh, organizing the workers. There are many different elements out there that are so anti-union that they will do whatever is necessary to stop unionism. Uh, you have governments that say we can't strike. We have replacement workers now. Everything that destroys the makeup of a union or a workforce. Now the struggles are even greater going into the 21st century. And it's going to take a coming together of the rank and files, uh, maybe even more so than the old days. In the world today, dominated by corporate deals and profiteering, the voices of working people are seldom heard. The union stands alone, demanding rights for the men and women who do the work. There is a continual struggle to keep the gains that we've made. If not, you know, things will re revert back to the days before we had a union. In the ILWU, it never ran away from problems. It never ran away from issues that are out there in the courts, the social issues. I can remember back during the civil rights struggles where unions were involved in this process, who were able to organize, get groups of people to go out, to protest in the streets, to knock down all these Jim Crow decisions that were in the South. Throughout its history, the ILWU has taken part in political debate. It has protested wars, marched against injustice and racism, and promoted legislation to improve the quality of life for all working people. It was a union that brought welfare and fringes. It was a union that helped the educate, public educational system. It was a union that struggled for community colleges for working people. These were not gifts from politicians and others. You are identified with your work. Regardless of how you look at it, you might call it the boss's job, but the work belongs to the workers. When you're doing the work, it's like signing your name. And if I sign my name to something, that means that I'm backing it. That's my bond. You know, and I'm representing the ILW, so I'm gonna do my best. When somebody come behind me and see my work, I want it to look good. For my decent wages, you know, I owe the hospital where I work a decent day's work every day, each and every day. I can think back to the, uh, before I became an ILW member, I used to go shopping and do a lot of window shopping. But since I've been an ILW member, I can go inside. I remember 36 years my children were raised, I have yet to see a doctor bill. And I thought to myself one time, I thought, where the heck would I be without that? Uh, I really, I, I can't comprehend ever not belonging to the union. I work in a warehouse and uh, warehouse industry and our benefit package is something our union has demanded and with our package my wife has uh, diabetes, she's got health challenges, <laughs> I'd be in a poorhouse without those benefits. And I think what unions provide for memberships more than anything else or just as important is a voice. I can stand up and I can be a rank and filer sitting down there that maybe people don't even know my name because of the size of the union but I have a voice and I can say something. What good is being in a union if you don't express what you feel is right or wrong? Being able to participate in a union structure has made a difference in my life and so many people that I work with. You're improving 
not only your own life, but other people that are yet to come by all the things that you endure today and overcome today. You've got to do your share. Somebody else can't do your job for you. And if you want to have rule from the bottom up instead of the top down, you better come yourself and do it and make sure that they do it. Whether you don't even speak at a meeting, you can be there and know exactly what's going on and make sure that the guys that do speak are speaking for you. The union is not another entity out there someplace, a third entity. It's you. You are the union. You know, we are the union collectively. The sign on the door says an injury to one is an injury to all. And then the friendly faces in the union hall. These are the things that you can buy them, and it's more how you feel. Most things of real value are invisible. Dignity, in one sense, can be measured by the material things that you are able to get because your union is successful in negotiating. However, dignity is also measured in terms of what happens to the human heart and the human mind. This is why it seems to me it's important for us to say, yes, I will participate because it gives my life meaning. However small I am, what else is there? The union enriches our lives. Through it, we are ensured a decent quality of life. Free from intimidation, we work with dignity and pride at our jobs. At our union hall, we find a place to belong, a place of shared solidarity and support. Being members of ILWU makes our lives better in countless ways. In terms of enriching my own life, uh, unions have, have given me integrity as a worker. They have, uh, they have made me uh, a person, a human being. <laughs> And I get a little emotional. That's the real joy of it, the choir that you sing with other workers. Alone, you're so little, you might think you're a great pebble. But it does give workers a stage, a place where they are somebody, and they can stand tall and be somebody. We have inherited a union dedicated to improving conditions of all working people. Carry on its traditions and organize under its banner. Its promise, its future, are in your hands.